What's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode two, season two of the Krause House podcast. Dude, I'm liking the, the drip. You look like Woo! you're uh, you look like you're in the GTA lobby right now, getting ready to pull off a heist. See that custom Krause House there at the top too. I thought I would do you know you, something you know to conceal the face a little bit, something Krause House branded, lime green. Thanks. Yeah, buddy. you look like you're about to rob a local LA fitness for guest passes or something. I'm about to rob your self confidence in all the amazing takes that I have on this show. Ooh, 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 <laughs> dog. All right, let's get it. Okay, so first off. And quite the obvious choice, the NBA Finals has officially wrapped up. Congrats to the Denver Nuggets, the first NBA championship for them. And also congrats to Nuggets fans in the Krause house. I know there's a few of them floating around out there. So I'll start off by saying, I mean, Nikola Jokic, man, like what? Just to throw some numbers at you real quick. He led the NBA playoffs this year in points, assists, and rebounds. Improved his career playoff three-point percentage to 45%. He shot 70% from the field this year, which is the highest of all time. And I just can't help but think, is this the best single season performance for a non-MVP in history? Would you say that? Yeah, I mean, it probably is. Those numbers are off the charts. Now, obviously, he's had some interesting matchups, but I certainly think it's probably the best single performance. I still agree that he's not the MVP, but yeah. Yeah, I would say the only one that kind of popped into my head was maybe, I think it was 05, 06 Kobe when Steve Nash won. I think he averaged like 36 points a game, something like that. One of his highest, I think, in rebounds as well. Like incredible season. I don't think it touches the Jokers as far as this year goes. Incredible year. I think he probably should have been MVP, but for the question's sake, I think it's probably the best single season performance of a non-MVP in history. Yeah. Also, kind of an interesting final. I mean, you get a matchup between two small market teams. I think the NBA and I think even your casual fan was probably hoping for a Celtics-Lakers final. It was the fifth lowest NBA finals watched since the Nelson ratings were introduced in 1987. A lot of people kind of hoping for that, that Boston-LA championship wouldn't want that. 6% ratings-wise, 6% below last year's finals. Playoff viewing actually overall was up by 11%. I think another thing that probably was kind of weird is that it was the highest combined total number of seedings that opponents have ever faced by an NBA championship. So the Nuggets had, in theory, cakewalk, I guess that's what the haters would call it, into the NBA final. So it kind of made for for a weird NBA final. But as a viewer, as an NBA fan, what, were your, what was your general take this year's final? Yeah, I mean, I think it was disappointing on a couple fronts. One was small markets. I think Jokic is boring to watch. I know that's a bit of a hot take, but like I was watching game five or whatever with some friends and it was just like, yeah, back to the basket, drop stack, little baby hook. Oh, no one's guarding him because they collapsed. So he's wide open top of the key three, hits a three, barely can dunk. Like he's just, he's boring to watch. He's obviously incredibly talented. He's just boring to watch. Jamal Murray is exciting to watch. But then you have a, a Heat team that had been thriving the entire playoffs by all these role players just going absolutely off, going ham. Jahimi Butler just making these insane shots and then that not happening on the other side of the ball. So you kind of have this boring dominant team from a small market against this Cinderella team that didn't play like a Cinderella at all. That's not exciting if they're not playing that underdog role. And I think for me, especially as a fan, I'm sitting there watching... I, why couldn't have this been the Bucks versus Nuggets or Lakers versus Boston or someone big to go guard Jokic in an interesting way? Even the Philadelphia Denver finals, I think is more entertaining to watch on a game by game basis. So I think all those things piled up. It's just unfortunate, but it, I think it was a, quite a bit of a letdown of a finals. That's not why they play the tournament. That's not why we play the season. It's just a fan critiquing one very small little sliver of it. What did you think? No, same thing. I drew a lot of comparisons to the NCAA tournament. Like it's your 11 seed making the final four or something like that. And it's amazing to watch the run. But then when they lose, you know, it's just like over that many games, you kind of start at one point, you're going to play like an eight seed. I think that's true. And so it happened to be the finals. Amazing, amazing run. But you're right. You mix a small market team with that plays really good basketball team but Jokic is boring not to get away from him we had some great boring players Tim Duncan comes to mind right incredible player not that fun to watch and then matched up with a team that just it finally hit a wall and so from an NBA perspective it's just tough to see yeah I think you had a few options I think the Bucks would have played them better the Celtics would have certainly played them better the Sixers but the Heat made it through so 
Yeah, I, I agree. It is what it is, but that maybe just gets us hype for next year. Speaking of next year, what's your way too early prediction for the 2024 NBA champ? Keep it punchy. Yeah, my go-to answer for the past year, a few years, has always been Bucks and Six. And honestly, I feel really bad saying that I'm beaten down a little bit. And so I'm going to go out and pick a little bit something different for my prediction and go Bucks and Seven, baby. Bucks and Seven. Let's go. Bucks are coming oh back. Gosh, Bucks are winning it. Bucks and seven. Let's go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the bees too. Except mine is the Boston Celtics, baby. <laughs> are they gonna have Jalen Brown back? That's my question. No, I don't true. think they bring That's him true. back. I, I thought. I thought that he may not come back in a few different ways. Um, for some trade rumors, which actually some of them look pretty good to round out that Celtics team. But uh, I don't know. I think if they want to compete next year. They'll have to keep them. So that has an asterisk there. As all of yours do. Yeah, of course. <laughs> all right, let's, let's move in. Let's move let's in. Let's switch gears a little bit. Yeah, yes. yeah, go for it. So we're wanting to talk about live and PGA merger. Mm-hmm. And so for folks that may not be aware of the big sports news, obviously, but you have the PGA Tour, you have the new upstart live golf, uh, and then you have the DP World Tour. So PGA is a classic golf. Live is that new Saudi-backed league that has drawn a lot of the top players. And the DP World Tour is this European tour. The terms are undisclosed, and but there's belief that the amount of capital here is really large. The PGA is going to retain governance over the operations of this sort of collective behemoth monopoly of golf. But the Saudi Arabia's public investment fund will retain effectively financial control over this new entity. And they'll have sole discretion to accept or deny new investments into the entity. And so a couple of examples here is like previously, it was reported that Phil Mickelson's paid $200 million to come. And even Tiger Woods, $800 million to join the league. And Tiger said no, Phil said yes. And what's amazing about those amounts of money as well is they're basically fully guaranteed. It's come out, play a handful of tournaments, try your best, take this paycheck, go home. PGA is very meritocratic in the sense that you got to come, you got to compete for either eyeballs with this new pool that we'll talk about in a second or the purse by actually winning. But either way, you got to go out and you got to perform in some particular way. And if you don't, you're out and you don't really make all that much money comparatively. There's a lot of accusations of sports washing, blood money, a whole bunch of drama between the PGA and live a bunch of lawsuits. And so it's wild that this merger sort of pops out of nowhere with the PGA tour commissioner, Jay Monahan really being vocal against Liv. And then all of a sudden, he's the CEO of this new joint venture, big checks everywhere, all is good. Here we are. The other kind of faction that's worth highlighting is Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods. They were big supporters of the PGA and really critical of a lot of the golfers who left for Liv. And in fact, some of the PGA attacked them and there was a whole bunch of controversy. And now here they are going back to creating this new Super League. One other area I wanted to highlight just from the business of golf that I think is really fascinating Last year, Rory, who stayed in the PGA, he made about $50 million from the sport. So not endorsements, but playing the sport. He made about $10 million playing in the tour. Uh, he made about 18 million from the FedEx Cup. So similar, again, playing in sort of their ecosystem. $12 million from the PIPs. And the PIP is that performance pool that they use to basically drive like social media interaction and how do we drive eyeballs and reward the people that are able to do that. And then $4 million from the DP tour. Tiger made $15 million last year playing just golf, and he made zero from actually competing in the sport, and he made 15 of it from the pit pool. So again, he's such a big draw. Even the fact that he's playing terribly, he's able to make a relatively big chunk of change by just showing up and drawing eyeballs. Dustin Johnson. Dustin Johnson was second in the world last year in terms of actual kind of raw golf earnings, and he made about $35 million. He paid a fraction of the amount of tours that Rory played or Tiger even tried to play. And all he had to do was show up and play golf. He didn't have to win. He didn't have to place. He didn't have to go viral. He just played golf and he made nearly as much money as Rory. So there's some big questions here about what does golf look like going forward? How does this reconsolidate? How does this come about? All these different things. But I'm just curious, you know, you're a casual golf fan. You're not a big golf fan. Is this any of this like even mean anything to you? Is it just a eh, new league or is there something interesting that jumps out to you in this sort of split and remerger and all the drama that's ensued? No, it certainly does. The commissioner of the PGA, I remember I saw highlights of him kind of explaining and the uh, sport washing and he used a lot of even patriotic jargon too. Okay. Why would you leave America? And it, to be honest, I was a little bit bummed to hear that the new, I mean, as a fan, it's great that all these players are going to be competing together again, but it was just very interesting to see his strategy to keep players involved and players passing up 
in some cases, hundreds of millions now deciding to merge and he'll be the CEO. I just would love to know what guys like Rory and Tiger think about that. I haven't heard any, not to say that they haven't spoke on it. I just, I haven't run across anything. It was kind of this weird roller coaster, and it's kind of been a soap opera in itself. And like I said, as a casual fan that occasionally checks out a major or two, I'm glad to see all these guys in the same league, but man, I just, the PGA looks a little bit bad here. Yeah, they absolutely like that. In PGA broadly, specifically the commissioner, there's certainly some questions and you're attacking really hard. These deals take time. So at what point did you know when, what, when, when were you having conversation? What's the kickbacks exactly. look like? What's your new role compensation look like? Some big questions. But I also think at the end of the day, this is about sports. It's about competing, about putting the best product forward. There's big questions and sort of allegations. There's a senator that's coming out and saying that there's a monopoly now. And it's funny because the PGA was a monopoly and then the live created themselves to be a non-monopoly and they're coming back together. Now, how is that now a monopoly, but it wasn't before. So there's, I think, some unusual questions here to navigate. But I do feel that for some of these golfers, the guys that decide to jump for live presumably made an absolute bag. And they may or may not feel like playing back in the tour in sort of a more intensive way because they basically have gotten retirement money to go forward. It's a really strange situation. There's a couple of golfers, I don't recall their names, but they turned down the live deal, stayed in the PGA, ended up getting hurt, really bouncing out of the league entirely. And you got to imagine they probably had offerings, 10, 20, $50 million, life-changing money. They said no because the PGA said X, Y, and Z. And now they're just shit out of luck. And, and I feel for those guys, especially we talk about Tiger's fine, 800 million, whether he plays and live, he'll make his bag e either way. Rory will make his bag. All these guys at the top, they're fine. It's just a question of guaranteed money or earned money. But these guys at the bottom on the fringe that were either starting to come up, that's where I think it really hurts. But at the end of the day, it's, we're going to, I think, this is the direction we're going to see. It's going to be better golf. There's going to be more competitive. There's more diversity in how we play it. Live is notorious. They play music and stuff as people are teeing off. It's a little bit looser. They have teams. They're really trying to push some of the new models, which I think are really great for golf. So it's a two steps forward, one step back type situation, I think, at the end of the day. But I think these trends are still going to play out regardless of how people feel about who funds what and how it works. Great golf's great golf. And I just think that's the reality we're, that we're in society. Yeah, it's really interesting. I actually think even their motto, right, is like golf, but louder, right? So they took a, <laughs> an entirely new spin on it. Let me ask you this. We've actually had this thesis that these incumbent leagues are really tough to knock off. Like the, I'm always known for saying, okay, it's really tough to out NBA, the NBA, all these leagues popping up. You can take some market share, but it's really tough. But we saw the PGA kind of, go on their heels a little bit. Wait a second. This wasn't supposed to happen. Now let's talk. Could you see this happening in other sports? I'll just quickly use basketball example, but scrape together 20 or $30 billion and just pluck the Damians, the Stephs, the LeBrons from the NBA, guaranteed contracts, throw in all the perks. I'm using basketball as an example, but could you just see this happening in any other sport? Yeah, it's funny you say that Chamath on the All In podcast floated that same idea. And he was like, hey, you could raise $30 billion, convince LeBron and Kevin Durant and Michael Jordan and go find some guys that have a huge brand power, maybe not their prime. I don't think it works in the NBA. I think because of how great the game of five on five basketball is, you and I have talked about the future of three and three and how that can compete and things like that. I think the phase that we're in right now is if I'm watching Tiger Woods and you're golfing really effectively against yourself in a certain capacity, right? You have handicaps, you have personal records, you have course records, all these things. Me watching Aaron Rodgers, Pat Mahomes, Tom Brady, Tiger Woods, Bryson DeChambeau golfing is entertaining. And they've had success doing these sort of one-off tournaments because the game is so isolated to just watching those shots, watching those moments, comparing it to this history. Whereas basketball to me is such a complicated dynamic game that requires that whole ecosystem of players and narratives and storylines. So I'm going to throw out some sports like golf, boxing, UFC, like if bowling had a competitive thing, maybe racing, F1 racing styles things. The things that were, it's like the one person has such a drawing thing and you can just have a commoditized backdrop that is the competitive space. Those are the ones I say yes to. All the ones that are a little bit more complicated and more intricate dynamic, I think less so. What do you think? I think it would be tough for the NBA, but for different reasons than you mentioned. I think one, the NBA has guaranteed contracts. They have that like lifestyle associated with them, right? You have musicians sitting courtside. You have 
Hollywood stars sitting courtside. They have this draw already that you don't really have to change the game a whole lot. And I think rule changes and things like that wouldn't necessarily help. Couple that last point That's a great with point. the fact that the NBA is one of the most innovative leagues when it comes to rule changes. Unlike the PGA, which is very, they pride themselves on tradition, right? The NBA is every year introduces new rules and even experiments with them in things like summer league or the G league. And so it's like, that actually is really, really tough. The only strategy you then have is just the bag, right? It's just like outpaying yeah. the NBA, which is that a bigger enough draw. And then you split the league and I don't know, it just becomes tougher. Right. I think the PGA was ripe for something like that because you could give the golfers their bag, but you could also, it's different enough where someone might say, all right, I'm a live guy now. I think the only sport in America that might have a shot is MLB. The MLB, mm. when you describe that, and now they do the pitch clocks, thank God. They're, they're trying some things here. But like, is it crazy to think in the next 20 years, if you went and got all the biggest names in baseball and modified the game in the field in some way, a little bit more home runs, a little less base running and fielding, and you're not dealing with the positional shifts, Maybe it's a machine that's pitching it, right? So who gives a shit about X? There, I, you could, I can imagine a world where you could have maybe baseball is that space. But like when I think of the NFL, NBA, NFL, maybe a little bit though too, but I don't know. Baseball's coming to mind, but don't feel strongly on that. No, I'm with you. Baseball would probably be a likely choice. I think a lot of ratings and attendance have fallen due to the reasons that you mentioned. So someone coming in and challenging all those assumptions. And we've seen these like wiffle ball highlights on, on YouTube and TikTok is, is, a, yep. is a big genre. We have Savannah Bananas down South, right? So there's enough interest to see a variation on the sport where if someone came along with, you know, that billion plus dollar investment to go tackle that, I think the MLB might be ripe, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. Let's touch on the trends here. I listed athlete empowerment and traditional ownership equals the middleman. Any trends? Do you agree with those trends? Any other trends? We can just touch on this before we move to the next topic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree certainly with the athlete empowerment. I mean, not to foreshadow into our next topic, but the power moving to the player is not only knocking at the door, it fully kicked down the door and barged in. We're seeing this happen. It's all about the player. It is all about the marketing capability for the player. And yeah, athlete empowerment absolutely is the trend I kind of see bucking here with Liv and, and PGA. Agreed. Okay, let's move on. Speaking of player empowerment, Messi mania has hit in a big way. Lionel Woo! Messi turns down a huge deal. We'll get to details that in a second to join Inter Miami and MLS. Ticket prices for Inter Miami have increased by a thousand percent. Miami's <laughs> Instagram account has 8X'd and now has more followers than the New York Yankees and the Dallas Cowboys. Wow. Individually. Not combined. Individually. Just individually. Right? So immediately one of the most followed teams in the US off a single headline. Is Miami the hottest sports city in the country right now? Finals, hot Stanley Cup, and Inter Miami. I mean, Derek. Easily. It easily is. So players... Post prime coming to the U S is actually not new. Pele did it in the seventies. He went to the New York cosmos. Beckham famously did it. The LA galaxy. What is super interesting. And I think people think paying players to come to the league is, is relatively new, but Beckham was the first wave in an upcoming tsunami, particularly in the sport of football, which is he negotiated in his contract, other than just getting paid a stack, to be able to bring a new expansion team to MLS for $25 million. Fast forward, of all teams, that was Inter-Miami. So he brings Inter-Miami to the MLS. That team is now worth $585 million. So really smart business decision by Beckham to say like, hey, overnight, I become the face of not only this franchise, but of the entire league, right? And so I want to have a future in its upside because I'm going to help it grow. So fast forward, Messi gets an offer for $400 million a year, $1.6 billion total in Saudi Arabia with no income tax. So that's $1.6 billion in his pocket. But he says no, because he knows, right, that all the eyeballs, similar to Beckham a couple decades ago, he'll have the same effect. So I think football is overdue for adoption in the US, quite overdue. I think the star power that some of these football, you're talking about Holland, Ibrahimovic, Ronaldo, Messi, 
like it's about time that we really start to hit velocity here in the US. Apple has a $2.5 billion deal with the MLS to stream the games. So knowing that Messi is coming to the United States, knowing that they're going to sell more subscriptions, they offered him rev share into that deal. And if that wasn't enough, Adidas says, you know what? Yeah, that's true. He'll definitely help us sell more shoes. So Adidas offers him rev share in their future earnings related to the endorsement Lionel Messi. So again, we touched this on the last segment, but these players, they're no longer athletes. They are brands themselves. And you're going to start seeing way more of shared upside in some of the most valuable brands. In Apple's case, the most valuable company in the entire world. And athletes are now aligned with them. And again, there's reciprocity in those deals. Crazy to see. So it's hard to fathom turning down one6 billion dollars to play football but looking back Messi will make a lot more money doing this over out the course of his life than he would just in those few amount of years anyway from a soccer perspective the impact here is obvious first of all what do you think about the terms of the deal that is structured that Messi was able to work out and what does this look like in the future for athletes yeah I mean I absolutely love the deal he's certainly betting on himself I'm not sure if it'll work will he for sure make him money it's nice to have that quote unquote guarantee by taking the other money effectively no income tax over in Saudi Arabia for that the deal structure as well apparently it's a lot of work he's betting on himself but you're right if he wants to kind of set himself and continue to make big cash flows here for the rest of his life not if that effectively he doesn't have to quote unquote work for anymore I like it. I like it a lot. And I think this is the type of deal we're going to see more and more of. It's awesome to see that this has happened a few times in MLS history. I'm not sure the league Pele played in. It wasn't the MLS, of course. But every time they make a deal like this, Beckham, Ibrahimovic, and now Messi, the entire league gets a big boot. And so you're getting arguably the best player of all time. So this is by far the biggest land in MLS history for sure. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Is this the catalyst that takes soccer mainstream here in the US? I think so. And betting on yourself in this case for Messi, I think is going to be really lucrative for him. Yeah. I love it. I love it. As trend. a casual soccer fan, a Ronaldo guy, I'm like, I'm curious to tune in. Like, I, it crossed my mind. I wonder how much the Apple TV Plus thing is. Should I look to see if there was going to be a game anywhere near me? Right. And this, it's certainly a powerful bet. 100%. 100%. Let's move on. This has actually become a part from episode one. So quick review. Nike released their Swoosh collection drop. We talked about that in great detail last episode, but no, no longer than I guess a week and a half later, they dropped another bomb from Nike and now EA Games that they are going to look to make the Swoosh NFTs and the OF1s NFT that they dropped was virtual items in future EA sports games. So again, last week, Nike's Web3 platform sold 100,000 OF1 boxes to 50,000 people and drove about $2 million in revenue. So very decent launch, if you ask me. We're quite possibly looking at one of, I think, biggest headlines in sports and Web3 intersection since inception, which is interesting. So last week we talked about, is this the catalyst that drives Web3 and sports mainstream? I think we both settled on no. And so were we wrong about this? Like to sum up my opinion, I'll say I might've been wrong because you're looking at something like Nike, which is one of the largest sports apparel brands in the world, if not the largest, getting into digital goods and then using gaming, which is a massive market as their distribution, right? So I think that formula in itself, in hindsight, is again, to my point is like, I think that might be the biggest sports Web3 headline we've seen to date. And it actually might be the catalyst to bring something like NFTs mainstream. But anyway, I'd be interested to hear your opinion. First of all, I'm never wrong. That's the first order of business here. Second of all, we talked a little bit about, I had mused about Zoom being that space. I think we had maybe talked about Fortnite, but like, how do you flex on people, no pun intended, in order to really do this? And I do think EA Sports is certainly a world that does have that power. NBA 2K is another world that comes to mind. Fortnite is another one that comes to mind. And so I do think by having that integration, by saying these are the favorite Nikes that you like to actually wear, you're playing this basketball game or this football game, and you actually get to exhibit those. And as long as those prices are right, I wouldn't call it a catalyst. 
but I think an excellent sort of early key use case that we hopefully can build upon. While I'm not technically wrong, and that's mostly a joke, I do think that this is a great marriage between two brands. I think my biggest concern prior was Nike just doing this standalone. Eh. But as they can integrate NBA 2K, EA Sports, I would like to know their kind of pipeline of deals they want to go do. Fortnite, if those lists are on there and they feel confident, then I could see a catalyst. I love how you said it's not a catalyst and then proceed to define catalyst as your definition. Yeah, if you don't believe me, you can ask me. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. So I think now we're getting into a philosophical debate of like, how long is a piece of string, right? It's like, it's like when is when? I think this thing, knowing that Nike is going to release this to consumers... I think a logical next step is partnerships B2B. So we kind of saw this coming, right? So it's why I think the point to the question is like, is it the catalyst? I'm ready to call this a full-blown catalyst. I think when you match, like I said, the, <laughs> the formula for a releasing digital goods, which is a bona fide business as we've seen, the distribution of gaming. I, although I'm not a gamer, my money has always been on gaming, bringing Web3 mainstream. And so I think that two brands, we have those two forcing functions. And now I think this is it. I think a well integrated uh, experience for EA that kind of maybe looks more like 2K, right? It's like these digital packs, right? Or creators with actual owned goods is pretty damn compelling. I love it. I'm yep. glad it's in the sports domain, honestly, just from pure personal opinion. Like I'm more, much more inclined to use by Nike NFTs in a future EA Sports basketball game than in Fortnite, anything like that. But yeah, I think, I mean, I think this is it, which is kind of exciting. Like, I seem way more excited about the headline than you, but it's I three in general, especially right now, needs something like this. And yeah, and I'm actually excited that it's in the sports domain. My beef is just, you can do all that with Web 2. And so then by doing it with Web 3, EA Sports, in my opinion, needs to commit to call it a 10-year roadmap that they are willing for you to buy, let's say, a Nike t-shirt. And that Nike t-shirt can go with you in FIFA. It can go with you in NCAA football. It can go in with you in football 23, football 24, football 25. And it's on them as brand cultural curators to drive that asset diminishing in value, not by them limiting hey, this is only a football 23 t-shirt. And so if assuming EA Sports is on board for that type of thing, then I can see it more. But I am nervous, just given the track record, especially of EA, yeah, that this you, is um, more of a money grab for them. You sound like a casual me. right now, dude. You sound like one of my normie friends. Would a normie be doing a podcast on a ski mask though? That's all I got to say. Agreed. I'm gonna, it's don't do that. Don't do that therapy bullshit on me, dude. <laughs> I know. I got that from you, dude. So I think that... That would be the point. I don't think, at least I, I mean, I would be shocked knowing that that's the advantage of doing this over selling straight digital goods. That's what you're signing up for. It, it almost seems- It's EA, dude. True, but it's it just seems like more work. It's very logical to say, hey, if we're going to do NFTs that are interoperable between games and you have to buy new ones every year, then it's more work and more frustration for them to do it via Web3 than just pure digital goods. So like someone in the organization 100%. has to say, yeah, totally fair if we just want to go pure digital good route, like Fortnite and 2K, but we shouldn't be doing them with NFTs then. That, that would be a conscious choice. Someone would have to step up and say that, which at an organization that big, hopefully it's one person. So I wouldn't be surprised, but, but I think that's what they're getting themselves into. Chances are that's what they're getting Don't themselves into. Don't underestimate a CEO saying, I want a good soundbite for my quarterly that says that we've now stepped into Web3 NFTs. And it goes top down to say, hey, these NFTs need to only exist for, because we both know from a technical perspective, there's nothing stopping them from saying this set of NFT IDs are the 23 versions and here's the 24s and you got to upgrade them and transfer them. And there's nothing technically stopping them because it's EA at the end of the day that will have the keys and Nike to keys to approving those on the allow list. You're probably right. I do. I just, I'm, I've been burned by EA being around the block a few times with their different innovation strategies. That point in 2021 and early 2022, I think a CEO dropping that headline last week of saying, Hey, we're all in on web three is not for show. In fact, you see the opposite with CEOs right now. Oh, Hey, our web three announcement that we made last year, actually just kidding. Right. Oh, we were that you see them backtracking. So I would say, sure. I'm not saying it's guaranteed. Obviously, of course it's not, 
but I think chances are that's what they're signing up for, given the time of the announcement, given the partnership, and giving their kind of behind on the whole digital good space. I'm hoping this is a multi-year plan and not a couple year plan that's not interoperable. That would just be a pain. Facts. All right. So let's get into this segment, boy. You straight capping. You salary cap. Oh God, I made it up and I Or is that the name of it? You straight no, cap. No, no, what, no, what no. So you salary I made it up and I didn't even get it right. You salary capping. You <laughs> salary capping. All right. So let me explain. Can I, I have a slight confession. No, let's hear your confession. You're already making excuses before. I was going to say, can we bump the cap a little bit more? To what? Just a little bit further. We have an 11. And so if you want two tier fours, as an example, you can't even fill out really the rest of the roster because the guys that are at sevens are ones. You know what I mean? So I would love to be able to round out. Can we, it was, can we have a $0, like a, a $0 guy is a value over replacement guy. Yeah, I'll give you Bob Cousy you know, for zero dollars. The, there you go. But that's it. All right, so all right, I, explain the rules. So listen, I have the better team. You're already making excuses. I have the better team. And I went under <laughs> the salary cap. I spent 10 bucks. <laughs> $10. All right. You went Michael Jordan and filled it out with just some Bob Cousy's to, to round it yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. It. Exactly. Okay. So how you salary cap and works is there's seven tiers of players, right? Going all the way from tier one. So you can tell I didn't make, I didn't make this list because there's one tier one, the goat, and that's Michael Jordan. That was an easy pass, but then it goes all the way to tier seven. There's more players in each kind of subsequent tier. But obviously you have the Michael Jordan, LeBron's, Kareem's at the top. You have some, quite the mix of players, actually. You got, I think, Tier 7 is Melo, AD, Dame. I have some old heads. I see, dude, not, I don't even recognize them. Bill Walton, for example. So the goal is to pick a starting five and spend under $11. But if you're Commodore, you might need some help, and that might be bumped up to 15 But I might go up to the luxury tax. Uh, is luxury tax at 13 <laughs> You can go into the luxury tax if you want. That's fine. My team is still winning. <laughs> All right. Are we going to go one by one? Or are we going to... No, give me your starting five. Blurt out our five. Give me your starting five. Go for it. All right. So with the number one signing, I will go tier three, which is $5 with Steph Curry. Starting it off with Steph. Okay. Next, I'm going to sign Giannis in tier four at $4. So I'm at now $9, which is where my mathematical inconsistency comes. I want to go into luxury tax and I'm going to go sign Reggie Miller for a dollar. So I should be now at 10. I'm going to sign Ray Allen for a dollar. I should be at 11. I'm going to go into luxury tax and sign. I went Steph went there. I'll pick up in his prime Carmelo Anthony for my last dollar. Dude, I go one that dollar is a over. Weak ass squad, dude. That's an L squad if I've ever seen one. <laughs> Holy Steph shit. Steph and Giannis alone with surrounded by shooters plus the mid range versatility of an in his prime mellow. I like it. I like it a lot. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Damn, I'm going to fry you under. Just like the ball hogs. Under. That's a championship t squad right there. With under the. Yeah, let's go. Side. I went. I you went $2 cheaper than me. Let's hear it. All right. So at point guard, I signed Dame for $1. Love it. Great signing. Because I'm looking at, I looked at Steph and there's no way. What was Steph? Five bucks? Yep. You get 5X in value from Steph? No way. When Dame at, at point Okay. Guard. That's fair. My That's two fair. guard, Reggie Schiller for $1. That's a no brainer. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm pulling up from anywhere with my backcourt. Yep. I like that. I went shooter heavy, so I need one kind of lockdown guy, but they can also get buckets. For $3, I signed Kawhi at the three. Pretty good. Pretty good. Yep. Prime, prime healthy Kawhi. I mean, at at four. Prime healthy Kawhi. Yeah. At four, I have Giannis for four bucks. <laughs> hey, here's the real story of the headline here is I won. Why? That's all that matters. I just won. It's great. Why? Because I, I, I signed Giannis? Because you took Giannis. Yeah, that's all that I means. wanted to take that's Timmy D, needed. but... I, didn't, I ran out of go money. to the goat. I hear you. All right, keep going. And my center for one dollar again, kind of, kind of no brainer. I have a healthy, happy Anthony Davis. Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah, and I wish I yeah. I, I assumed everyone was healthy. I really like a lot of value in the Anthony Davis. A lot of value in Dame. I think you're underselling a little healthy Carmelo, young healthy Carmelo. 
pretty elite player there given his spot but Kawhi, healthy Kawhi, is another great signing so, i need yeah, i needed someone squad. on the court playing defense dame's a cone reggie miller's a cone i have cool dude i'm gonna hold my team to some actually i take that back i have a pretty solid defensive squad Giannis, you have Giannis, Giannis Kawhi. yeah yeah so i mean d i mean like good weak side rim yeah protector, yeah maybe. good enough he's not exactly a cone like yeah. my backcourt is but i almost went and grabbed Shaq and then built around Shaq. i think that would have been an interesting matchup had i done that mm. i feel like you could put a pretty good team around him that would be really hard to defend it's like it's anthony davis garden Shaq in his prime hell no so if you could get the right balance of shooters around him Man, that was the other strategy. Like I saw James Harden here for two dollars. Yeah, thought that was a really high value pick there. Russell Westbrook at two dollars. Is that prime Russ? Shit, that's a good one. Paul Pierce in his prime at two dollars. Those are some really great value buys. I thought about Paul Pierce actually. Mm -hmm. But can you give me some love on the Carmelo at a dollar? Prime Carmelo for a dollar, dude. Come on. I think there's better plays on the board, man. I really do. I really do. Do you think a prime? Is that Rick Barry next to Harden right there? I was actually looking for Rick. Let me see. I think that is right next to the right of James Harden, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, it might be. I think that's him. But do you think a prime Carmelo is better than Isaiah Thomas? So, yes, I'm going to get some major heat for this. I think Isaiah Thomas is, one of, the, is one of the most overrated point guards in history. Do you think a prime Carmelo is better than Carl Malone? So, okay, we both did this, actually, but I have one of the strongest recency bias out of anybody that I've ever talked yes. to in the NBA. I think that a mid-NBA player today will absolutely shit on most 90s players. And then 80s, 70s, forget about it. I think the game, and this, the, my, my whole thesis, we've talked about this a lot, but my whole thesis is that it's not related to the player and the player's ability. It's not their fault. I think nutrition is better. Training is better. There's more information available. The game has evolved. Players have gotten more skilled. More skill has been passed down over generation. I'll say the same thing about players in 2040 as I'm saying about players today. I just will. The game yeah, we'll and see. people we'll just we'll get better. So obviously I'm heavy skewed to more recent players. And so again, people argue this back and forth all the time on the internet, but yeah, dump Carl Malone in today and he's just not putting up Carl Malone numbers. I'm sorry. He's just not. Yeah. I think, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I think w we could go in circles about it, which we have, but when I compare generations, I, the reason I don't like to compare generations is I just feel like it, there's too many things because had Carl Malone been born with all of that and been able to develop into it, I think that Carl's game as an example probably doesn't translate super well. No one really wants to, like <laughs> mid range pull up big man slashing anymore. But like, I think it may be Allen Iverson's game. What does his game look like if he's born 20 years later? I'm looking at Gary Payton's game. Who else? George Gervin. You know, if he's born 20, 30, 40 years later. I think those guys, I think, still play in the NBA uh, as an example. This, so, that's my point, though. That's my point. Is that it's not their fault. Right. Are they athletic enough then to adapt to the game now? I think in most cases, yes. Right. But like to your point, like Kevin McHale, does Kevin McHale make it beyond D1? in the modern era, even born, like you just need so many athletic gifts these days. You need to be able to explode and finish at the rim, be able to bulk up and muscle. Like I was even just re reading Wemby's da draft profile and they're like, has a good frame, probably can put on a bunch of muscle. We'll need to put on a bunch of muscle. And you're like, you know, if you're thinking about 1970s draft board, yeah, that, their body was their body. They're not thinking, oh, this guy can go put on a Giannis 50 pounds of muscle over the next five years with the right nutrition, this strength and conditioning coach. I'll give you that. But I also like to play a little more wizard, which is why I just, I stick it into regular generations. But I hear you. Your squad's good, man. Just not as good as mine, but uh, you took Giannis and that's all that matters. You went over, <laughs> you're hitting with the luxury tax. So what is that? went over the budget. I mean, that means that you have to, have to admit the luxury tax is admitting that my team is much better than yours. That's the official tax. Yeah, so maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that is the case. Okay. Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. That is that, folks. Thanks for checking this out. We will be back next week, of course, and with more amazing takes from my side. Not so much from the GTA character we have across from me here. But stay tuned and good night. Wag bet. White bat. White bat. Sweet.
Ooh, so is the league's coming back pretty yeah, soon. Check out the big three ball hogs, according to Rick, future champs. Gonna win it all. Let's get it.